Hello, everybody. How are you doing? We're getting ready to get started here. Uh, it is good to see each and every one of you. We have had a great day thus far, just making sure that the Ready, Set, Go conference uh, goes according to plan. And I'm here with my good friend, uh, Jack Eady, Dr. Jack Eady at West, uh, Western Carolina University. We're going to talk about there's no elevator to the top. And guess what? You got to take the stairs. Uh, so it's going to be interesting today. For us. We're going to talk about some real stuff. Jack, go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with everyone and the good doctor, William <laughs> Irvin. Uh, a little bit about me. I am from the great state of South Carolina. Uh, I'm a graduate of Florida State University, University of Georgia, and University of North Texas. I taught for 12 years in uh, Title I schools in Orlando, Florida and built, uh, built programs from the ground up until state uh, reputable programs. And now um, I'm at uh, Western Carolina University starting up here and I'm just so glad to be with everyone here today. Absolutely. And then, of course, as he already said, I'm William Irvin and uh, currently uh, work as the educational support manager uh, for the Southeast region at Con Selmer. And I am also the director of the HBCU Collective uh, with our Con, Sel Con Selmer Institute. Uh, so we look forward to, to all the things that we do with LME already uh, from a standpoint of working with Con Selmer. I have been teaching uh, or taught before Con Selmer for 20 years, uh, also in uh, Title I schools, uh, large ones, small ones. I taught at Benjamin e. Mays High School in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as Baker High School in Louisiana, uh, where the most notable programs. I had a chance to teach college as well at Mississippi Delta Community College, as well as assist the bands at Clark Atlanta University and Mississippi Valley State University. So quite a long stint. We've had a chance to do things together. And to, collectively today, Jack and I just want to say thank you for having us. We, you know, it, it took a lot for you to come and, and give us your Saturday to come learn a little bit more. And uh, as you can see from the picture on the screen, we love hanging together. We love talking with each other, each other and our families love uh, embracing each other and moving through life together. So we're proud of each other. And we just want to share a little bit with you about how we've experienced our programs over the years. And so let's, we're going to start on floor one. We're going to talk about mission and vision and how you need to have uh, a great idea of what that is from the school standpoint, and from the program standpoint, and make sure that they are aligned uh, together. And developing that mission and vision is very important. It's important to share it with stakeholders, uh, especially your students, so that they know what's going on uh, with you, your program, and your ideas of how you want things to go. Uh, you definitely want to develop short and long-term goals. Those goals, that goal setting process is very important. Um, you know, so strategic goals, the strategic plan that you can put forth for your program. What's going to happen in a year? What's going to happen in three years? What's going to happen in five? You know, what we're going to do. And when you're planning, it's important to rethink what you're doing. You're going to always have to revise what you're doing. And then when you figure out that it's going to work, go ahead and implement it. Go ahead and implement what you're doing because, hey, give it a try. It's going to work. Uh, Jack, you know, we always talk about, and our good friend Marcus Morris, who's on here now, always talks about, you know, finding out what your why is, establishing your why. And, you know, how important is that to you? Oh, it's, it's so important. And, you know, depending on the different situations you go in, your why becomes a different reason. You have to see, like, am I coming here to, to make sure every kid goes to college? Am I coming here to fill in seats? Um, am I coming here to change lives? What am I doing? And establishing your why and building your vision and goals uh, towards them. Yeah, you got to do that. And sometimes you have to revisit that teaching philosophy. You know, that one day they have us right up when we're in school. <laughs> you know, we, were, we wrote one up in undergrad and in grad school. We did the same. You know, I had to do it at all three levels. And, and uh, that changes because, you know, school changes, students change, uh, the culture changes. And we got to be prepared to move along. Uh, we've heard all day today to meet the students where they are meet those musicians where they are so that we can take them to where they want to go. Uh, so, and, and one of the big things that I know you're huge on is planning for the program you want later now. Talk about that a little bit. And before I even jump in, I want to add one more thing. This first floor, the mission and vision for your program is super important. And so Absolutely. as, as, uh, 
as Will, um, excuse me, Dr. Irving. Uh, Will is fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, talk, talked about establishing your short and long-term goals. It's important for you to write them down. Uh, when I was a young teacher, I used to carry this notebook, this little pocket notebook in my pocket. And anytime I thought of anything, either, hey, I want to do this in the future, or hey, the clarinets made this sound. How do I fix? I would write it down and I would have it to come back to, or I could plan for that, or I can ask questions. Now we have these trusty, trusty cell phones and you have your notes and I want to encourage you to do that. One day in, in the future, I would love to be a director of bands. And so I have a note that just says director bands. Anytime I think of anything, how I want to treat people, how I want to program, all that kind of stuff. I write that, I write that in uh, my vision, uh, vision for, for myself. So planning for your future now, when you're creating those mission and visions for your, for your program, you bring, bring your kids in, your kids may not be at that grade five level like you want them to be. They may come to you at a grade one or 0.5. I don't know about you. Um, I, um, I guess I should say it a little bit about the program I taught in. Um, I started at a program where we, I had 13 kids in the program and we grew it you know, tremendously. But I had a lot of kids who are in my program that have been playing for seven years and they, they didn't know how to read music. They didn't know what good tone was. We called them the instrument holders. And so we had to figure, figure out ways to you know, still still keep our program running, still do all the things that was expected of the program, but how can we like transfer their mindset and our mindset to get to the future? So changing that beginning band band mindset and to get in there. And so finding ways for you to do that, writing it down and and going for it and sharing that with your kids as well. Hey Jack, what they say when well, in church they tell us what write the vision and make it plain. Make sure and make sure we share with everybody. You got to have that. You know, we're going to we'll pass the offering plate just a little while. <laughs> but it's also important on, on floor number two, Jack, to teach who you have, why you got them, when you have them. Uh, so oh. talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, look, uh, of course. Like, you don't know who's going to walk in your room. You don't know if the person is they, they come from a, a family of millionaires or their lights may not be on. You know, they 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 may be the parents in their home. They may be, you know, they, they may not be able to afford anything. And so you have to figure out who the kids are in your program and you want to teach them how or treat them how they deserve to be treated, no matter who they are. And sometimes you have to take a step back and be like, oh my God, Brian, what is going on? Is like, what, what, are, what are some ways I can do to help, help, help Brian be the best version of himself. So sometimes you have to investigate. You got to find out a little bit about their backgrounds and and that 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 will sometimes help lead to you. For me, and I can't say you, you can do this in your program, but in my program, I remember going to undergrad and they were like, don't don't say shut up to your kids. Don't don't do that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's disrespectful. And I remember my first day teaching and when I when I started teaching at first I taught middle school. And I was the fifth band director, fifth, fifth band director that year. It was a reason because those kids were terrible. But, <laughs> but we had, we, we, I had to figure out where they were and, 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 and get on their level. And so the first day, it, it, it was, it was, it was terrible. And I was like, hey guys, be quiet, be quiet. And they were looking at me <laughs> like I was crazy. And this one parent came after school. And she was like, boy, if you don't get your stupid little blah, 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 insert many curse words in the car, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? I can't talk to my kids the way that I learned at school. I had to like get on their level so they can understand me. So I came the next day and I'm like, no, no, we're going to get to it. No, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to do it this way. And it really opened their minds and, and changed them. We got to know what their aspirations are. One, some, they may be just to get through high school and how can we help them you know be that first person to get high get through high school or be that first person to actually go to college you know right. help help break them those barriers so we can like you know help them be successful because that's what it's really really all about and i think we do that one the most important thing we can do is relation relationship building 
And that relationship building equals program building. No quarter note you teach, no left link, no standard attention Come on. matters yeah. unless you're building relationships with those students. Once those students, and, and we say it all the time, once the students know that we care about them, they'll do anything for you. I haven't taught in, in, at Oak Ridge High School in seven years, and I can still call up my kids and they'll take a bullet for me. They'll come and move, they, they'll do everything they can for me because of the relationship I have I have built um, with them. And it's so important for you. And as we're starting the as we're starting this new year, some of you may have already gone through band camp. Are you going through band camp now? Sometimes it may take for you to, you know, take that step back and say, how can I build relationships with my with my students? And the funny thing is, that's different with every student. And it goes back to figuring out what their background is. Next, you got to figure out what your resources are. And um, I have this teacher, uh, I had this teacher in undergrad. Uh, he's like, what happens if you have three bassoons, a tuba, and a clarinet? It doesn't matter. You got to teach them. And so it doesn't matter the resources that you have. You have to make a way out of no way. So, and, and, I, and I'll just continue saying some things I did. I, I remember that, that first day going into the band room and you opened practice room one and they had taken all the instruments out and just threw them in that practice room. You open practice room two, they had taken all of the, of the concert band sheet music and just threw it in that practice room. And so I'm like, okay, well, one, I got to get organized. I got to, I, I have to make this room yes. presentable for my kids. Dr. White, the emeritus uh, director of bands at FAMU, he always says the band room has to be in tune. So meaning like nothing is out of place. There's no trash on the floor. All the chairs are where they need to be. And so I think you have to have that band room in tune for us to make, you know, us to make great music and have a great atmosphere for the students. So what I did, we took all those instruments out. I called all my little friends from college that was in college band with me. I'm like, hey, can we figure out a way to play this? I'm like, hey, Mr. Music and Arts guy, I'm this new guy. We don't have much. What can you do to come help us? And trying to figure out what I can do with what I had. I would beg, borrow, and deal. I'm like, oh, you still, you, you don't have a, a baritone? Uh, or that baritone is 50 years old? Can we just use it and try to try to make it better? So that you try to make sure that it doesn't matter. Like, we don't, we don't make excuses. We make, we make problems happen. We make, we, make, we make the realness happen for our kids. And then what's really important is setting a culture of excellence. And if you're coming into a young program or if you're a new teacher, your, your, your students may not understand what excellence is. And I have to explain to you, excellence doesn't just mean that you get a superior or you're getting this award. Excellence can mean we had all of the clarinets show up on time for class today. Johnny, you actually marched on step during, during, the, show to, during the show today. We have to set those, those level of excellence. Now, yes, do we want the kids to continue playing or growing and playing with better tones and understanding better rhythms? Yes, but we have to set that culture of excellence. Everything we do, even if we're at a, you know, quote unquote, good level, we want to make sure we're striving for better and we're doing that through and through what we ex what we expect of them and how we how we allow them to work through and with our program and we have to make sure we do it from day one so like if they come in our, if they're coming in our, in our classroom and I expect you to come in with good discipline and good order we're going to yes. do that and we make sure they understand that and, and we celebrate them whenever we can Man, you know, a good friend of ours, Jack uh, Cameron, always says, you know, uh, life moves at the speed of relationships. And you just talked about how important those relationships are. And so if we had if we develop the, the rapport with our stakeholders and things like that, then our, those relationships will move our programs to be better than they were before, which, you know, in turn becomes that definition of excellence, being better tomorrow than you were today, being better today than you were yesterday. So, you know, we learn from our friends. We, we get that rapport with them. We develop those relationships. So we take those jewels of knowledge 
that they've given us, and we're able to impart that among other people. And so, yes, no resources, no problem. Yeah, you got to be creative and innovative about how you go about getting those things. Call those friends that you haven't called in a long time because they got the <laughs> stuff you need. Yeah, lean on them a little bit. Cook that gumbo uh, that, that, that Brett was talking about earlier and bring them over and tell them to bring those instruments and those reeds because your students need them. Pizza, going to go to the third floor. Pizza, pizza and drink do, does a lot for everybody. Oh, it's you crazy. better believe it. The best thing ever happened to me was Little Caesars. Boy, you get those $5 pieces, you get some stuff done. <laughs> You get some stuff uh, done. Fundamentals, uh, folks. Fundamentals day one. You got to have the fundamentals. You got to establish those routines. Jack and I, we often joke about how we go back and forth uh, with our students, you know, on day one. How you come in the classroom and, you know, it might be day 30 and they, they decide to come in the classroom you know, the wrong way. Guess what? We're going to go back in the hallway and we're going to try it all over again because you, you have been taught, you have been trained how to come into the band classroom. You've been trained how to take the instrument out of the case. You've been trained how to care for that instrument. You know, it, you know. we talked earlier about what Dr. White and Dr. Chipman talk about at FAMU, about the, the rehearsal room having good intonation. You know, room, the room has to be in tune. Everything is, has to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, you, you, everybody will be successful because of that. Uh, step one on the third floor. Yeah, we're taking some steps, folks. Discipline. How we start is how we finish. Man, and yeah, I said steps because you know I don't, I don't I don't feel like walking steps, but we'll talk steps today. <laughs> we'll talk steps today. How you start is how you finish. If you start off by just jumping in and and moving into literature without doing the fundamentals, without working on articulation and other techniques, then guess what? You're not going to finish well because you have not built them up from a great foundation. Mm. The foundation has to be solid before you can build anything, or it will crumble. That's 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 plain facts. And so you have to set the discipline. And once you set it with playing and how you enter the room and, and how you take care of the music library and how you take care of your peers and, and how you set up your student leadership training. Every aspect of what you do, as long as you're disciplined when doing it, then the organization will continue to grow on a solid foundation. Mm. Uh, we got to take care of that. That's going to help you with your organization and classroom care. You know, I never had to worry about that. Uh, even my, my feeder uh, director who is on here today, Tori Williams, he, he keeps a clean van room. And he instills in his students to keep a, cl a clean band room. And so when they come to the high school, when they came when I was at, at Baker High School, they knew what it meant to put the stands where they're supposed to be after every period. They knew what it meant to put the instruments in the right uh, containers at the end of rehearsals or at the end of the class period. That was very important. And warm-ups, I don't care if we have a 45-minute class period. We're going to warm up and we're going to play technique drills. We're going to play chorales and we're going to sing. All of those things are very important in building the foundations uh, for your, your band program. Those are the fundamentals that you need on day one. Jack, talk to us about recruitment and retention. Re recruitment and retention is the, the lifeblood of our programs. And I think we all understand that. And I want us to realize that one, recruitment and retention starts at home. How you treat your kids, so the expectations you have from your kids, the experience your kids have, it really makes the big difference if they want to return and come back. If they're going to go to their middle school feeders and be like, oh, man, Mr. Jenkins is so fun. We have a good time. We learn a lot. Are they going? They're going into the computer. They're going into, into the community and they're like, oh, my God, I love the band. You have to come to our concert or when we're at the parade. Give us a shout out. And so as as teachers, we have to find innovative ways to grow the seeds you plant. And realize that, you know, when you're when you're in your garden, your garden's at your house. It has to start. It has to start at home. It starts with us making that safe space for our students. Our students want to know that when they come into the band room, it's their it's their haven. All the problems that they have at home with their girlfriend and boyfriend. Leave them you know, at the door. We're leaving them at the door and we're just coming in here and we're just having a great time making making music. And with this, with these, you know, with this garden, you have to realize that the different, there are different soils everywhere you go. So things that work at my school might be different at your school. And you have to find the ways that work for you and, and your community. For me, uh, I'm all about that connection, make, making those connections before they get to you. 
Um, when I was a middle school teacher, I was in the elementary school's classroom at least every other week. When I was a middle school, when I was a high school teacher, I was in the, the middle school classroom all the time. And you want to make it to when you walk into their room, they're like, hey, Mr. Edie, what's up? And so they know you. So when when they actually come into you, they, they're comfortable to you. I want I want to also, you know, encourage you to invite them to to be on campus as much as possible, like find ways to like, you know, have those high school band nights or you can, you know, have a pre MPA and invite them to your school. Right. One thing that was really successful for me is on our fall concert when the marching band played, we may not have a lot, a lot of concert music to play, I would invite my middle school feeders and we play like a, a great, like I have them all play one piece and we play a grade one or 0.5 piece together. And it got a chance for them to meet the kids or meet the other students and see how they could work with me. And having them on campus, having them see how you work, how you interact with the students, seeing how close your band is, seeing how they, they are family, that's super important. And then you wanna make sure that product that you're putting out, like it stays relevant. So for me, I wanted the Oak Ridge band to always be out there. When we're in a parade, they wanted to know that it was gonna be a great performance from the band. When we came to, and when we when we came and visited their band room, you know, they would know that they would enjoy enjoy the time with, with our students. And the more and more you you're out there and you're putting putting your students out there and these experiences out there for your students, they will want to come and be a part of your program. Is that build it and they they will come. And then lastly, traveling. That's <laughs> like some of the that's some of the best things that we can offer. Nothing says like I want you to join band like wow, the band just took this trip to New York City or like like Will, oh yeah, we played at Carnegie Hall and we did this <laughs> and this and this. Nothing says like we want you to be or I want to be a part of that band when you're taking when you're taking trips like that and you're you're making it fun and a musical experience for them. And a trip to Disney World doesn't hurt. You know, magic music magic music days always works. Universal I I lived Universal in festivals, or you lived in Florida, but <laughs> y'all did Universal almost every month. So you know, that, that was a great fundraiser for you. So you know, that's those are those are the things to think about. You travel, oh yeah, we we're gonna get in the band because they're gonna go somewhere, and that's really important. We're gonna travel up a little ways to the top, folks. We're gonna go to the fifth fifth floor, and we're gonna talk about the fact. Hey, now you got them. What you gonna do now? Uh, step one: remediation. Yeah, we got them, especially after COVID, folks. We're gonna have to really. Uh, remediate and teach some of the things that were missing last year. And uh, uh, Cameron also drops this this term, and I love it, vets and VIPs. Both of them are going to need the help, the vets being those returning students, even if though they've been in the band before, they probably missed a few things uh, last year while we were out. And VIPs, those are your your, your rookies, your, your new students that are coming in. They have no idea what we're going to be doing in a high school or college band or whatever level you're teaching, even middle school. You want to make sure that you're reaching out to all of them to to make to, to close the gap, if you will, uh, of, of, of the things that you can do to make them better musicians. Uh, step two, select appropriate literature. Oh, Jack, man, this is one of your things. And I, I always want to make sure that I pick something not only that I like, but that the students can connect with. That's very important because once they have buy in, then they're going to play the best they can. Uh, for you. So, you know, if, if they like it, if they understand why it's important, if you give them the historical context, if you if you make it about present day so they can see what's going on with the music, they're going to be there for you and they're going to dive into it so much that it'll become second nature for them and it'll become a part of who they are and they'll be able to present that in a better way at contest or at a, con a concert or even when they're in the rehearsal setting. Talk to us about selecting literature uh, for, for our programs. One, it, it's, it's super important to find, like when we say the appropriate literature, one, um, a lot of times us as directors, we have to humble ourselves. Like we, we leave our colleges and we play in these grade six pieces and we get to our grade two bands and we're like, yeah, I'm going to play four Scottish dances with them and they can barely play, play Battle for Bond. And so we, we really have to humble ourselves as directors and really see what level our kids are on and what we can, what we can get to them. This whole diversity piece is super important. 
and not it, it's important because of, of the access and we want we want to bring in people that look like the people in your program right to there so they can get great examples of all all different um, all different types of nationalities um, and genders etc and we want to make sure we're providing the best experience also if, if if your band is a band that's not as diverse and you're putting diverse um, diverse pieces in front of them you give them um, giving them ideas to, that show that they are still high quality uh, people at all all levels that they that they may not have seen before. And one thing I want to encourage you, it's not just the inside thing that we have to focus on this diversity piece. Yep. In your march in your marching band, don't play just music that you like or don't play music of one genre. Find music of, of many, many different genres because there's so many people at the marching band game. Like there's the grandmas, there's the football team, they're the teachers, they're your students. And you want to find all kinds of music that they can play so everyone will enjoy, everyone will have a time to enjoy what was going on. That's very important. And and, and, it, and the next thing that's important, I believe, Jack, is to make sure that your students get an opportunity to play at different venues, whether that's locally, in the statewide, citywide, you know, whether it's playing a holiday concert at the mall or whether it's playing at City Hall or whether it's going to a local college. I know, Cameron, you mentioned trips to a local college. Using your local colleges for everything is very important. You know, when you don't have means, we talked about not having resources, you know, if you need private lessons and can't afford them, then you get those graduate students, you get those music majors to come by and do master classes and work with your students. That's that's the way to do it because guess what? Those college students need community service hours in, in a lot of cases. And they'll get you to sign off on them because they come and work with your, your students. Uh, apply to play in places, even if you don't think you're ready. That helps your program get keep moving up the level of performance. Uh, don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to open your band room and ask for your colleagues to come in and help. I, mm. you know, Jack and I are connected a, a little bit more because we believe in collaboration. You know, collaboration is key. And working with those people who know more than you or differently than you and they can come in and and express themselves and get those points across that you might not have been able to get across that's gold folks bring those people into the band room so they can help your students bring them into the orchestra room uh, orchestra room so they can help your students don't be afraid to bring them in the choir room so they can sing to your students all of these things are very important also well can i can i add one, one more thing absolutely one thing that was really important to me in my program was the solo ensemble, the all county and, yes. and all region. And I, I had some kids that had no business auditioning or are going to solo ensemble because they weren't ready in, in other people's eyes. But for me, them taking that those time to learn the measure and maybe they couldn't play the piece at 160, but they got it to 100 and they had the instrument at their face. And it made them practice and it encouraged them to get better and learn difficult pieces and learn things that they might not be able to do. It was so important for my program. And, and they got better. Huge, and they got better. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and another huge thing was actually, I, I call it the cafeteria, the, 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 the warm up room. Mm -hmm. You go to the warm up room and at first my kids would be like, oh, my gosh, those kids are gods. I'm like, no, they're the same age. They have the instrument and the time just like you, just practice. And the more and more I went from those kids or guys to like, oh, I'm just as good as them to, oh, I'm better than them. And I think that experience of getting them into the classroom, I'm sorry, getting them into that cafeteria and auditioning for solo and ensemble and, and keeping the instrument in them out, and it helped. And just like Brett said, those individual skills in turn help build the full group. Absolutely. And you remember earlier when I talked about planning and how you should rethink, revise, and then implement? Well, guess what? Even when you're in the teaching phase, even when you're preparing your students to perform, you got to continue to build upon, reteach, find those things that were, 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 def were the deficits and make sure you go back and reteach them and enhance the lessons and strategies that you went over earlier in the classroom or earlier in the week or earlier in the semester. We got to make sure that they're transferring the knowledge that you gave them to every piece of music that you're going to be playing the rest of the semester. I know this was important to you too as well, Jack, to, to definitely build upon the things that you've taught them and, and reteach as well as enhance the things that you told them because they need to hear it more than once. 
Yeah, and you know we're we're all in in the band land. It's all about tone and and, and technique, and so find finding ways uh, to do that. Like uh, in, in the beginning, when I had those those seven year instrument holders, I had <laughs> to find a way to get them to read the method book so we could actually learn how to read and learn the proper fingering. So I would put all the kids advanced and beginner in the same class. Yeah. And I just tell the older kids, hey, you're here to help the younger kids play when in essence, they were all learning how to read. And I'm a big proponent of the scale, 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 scales, and the technique and fluency to help build. And I encourage you to do a, sc a scale a week um, to, to build that fluency and the cool. So they're, they're 36 uh, weeks in, in the school year. And so that gives you time to do the 12 scales at least three times uh, through the school year. And so maybe you can play it one octave one time, two octaves the next time and build, build the fluency and uh, tempo and articulation the next time and figuring out ways to just encourage the growth through all of these fundamentals that we're doing. Absolutely. And at this point, I got to remind you, you know, while we always concentrate on our why and why we're teaching everything, you got to concentrate on the fact that we want music to be fun for us and our students. So make music fun, make band, choir, orchestra fun for our students, and it'll continue to be fun for us as well. Let's go. Let's go on up to the sixth floor. Building student leaders. I guess, think, guess I think, what? Well, <laughs> we walking up, we walking up six floors. I think we'd be tired by now. Uh, I am well, well. I am a little tired. You know, it's, it's all right. I got some Kool Aid over here. Uh, <laughs> hey, in most cases, I know in my case and in Jackson, when we taught in public schools, our student leaders were our staff, and that's that's important to that. That's why the training of these students is very important. So I am definitely want to pass it to Jack because this is one of your brainchild here. You know, hey, develop your students by mentoring. Yes. And so in, 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 in how do I say this? The, the, there's no PC way. My kids were very, very, my kids are very, very hood. Um, hood. When, when, when I taught them and they didn't understand anything but the hood life that they learned. And so I had to one, teach the leaders how to be leaders. And I had to teach the students how, how to, how to understand the leadership or how to work through leadership so they could, they could be a team. The mentoring aspect is super, super important in, in this because you get, you get the older kids um, to, to work with the younger kids. I had a beginning band and I had older kids coming in there all the time, or I had a younger um, symphonic band and the older kids coming in and teaching, teaching sectionals and teaching this. And like Will said, we didn't have a big staff and so I had to train my kids to be the staff that I want. Did they make mistakes? Yes. Of course. But yeah. we, we had to help them learn from the mistakes and continue to grow and be better with everything that they did. And it's important to model to those student leaders how you want them to do it. So you got to you have to be cognizant of the fact that everything you do in the classroom, everything you do on the podium, every letter that you send out, everything that, that you're doing, they're watching, and that's going to give them the, the idea of how they need to be as leaders. It's important to do your own training uh, because you want you have the vision and the mission for the program that you want to impart on those students. But it's also uh, very important to uh, attach yourself to people in uh, the band world or music education world that you know have the same ideas and ideals that you do, and they can come in and explain things slightly different than you would, but it uh, it will attach themselves to the students a little bit more where they can understand it. They're meeting them where they are in places where you could not meet them. So that's very important. And I also agree with you, Jack. It's important to train the leaders to know how to lead, but it's also important to train those that are not leaders so they can understand the leadership process and how they are to follow in, a, in an effective way. So that's very important. Whew. Now let's go up one more floor, Jack. <laughs> so seventh yeah. floor. My favorite, communication and collaboration. Hey, folks, nobody can tell your story better than you. It is important that you are your best marketing agent. Anything that goes on that's positive in your program, share it with the world. Share it with the city. Share it with your administrators. Share it with the school district. Share it with the parents so they can put it on Facebook and share it with the world as well. 
you want to make sure that they see that the program is affecting their student in a positive way. Tell your story. Use social media in a great way. Now, Jack, you're the social media guru. Tell them about that. I, I think it's important for us to use social media, especially in, in today's climate. One, social media gives the, the consumer um, an immediate insight access to what, what we do. And so if you're uh, having, having rehearsal and you're going to show a clip of rehearsal, or you're in the stands and you want to show a clip of what's happening in the stands. It gives them that different viewpoint of your program. And it's almost like they become like, you know, majority stakeholders because they can get yeah. that little, that little stake in, in what you do. And I want to encourage you, like, even if you aren't social media people, use your students to, to be your social media marketing team. Now right. you're going to have to train your students to help you, because they know exactly what to do, but they don't know how you want them to do it. So train your students to do that. And then you have to figure out ways to diversify your social media outreach. Right now, we know Facebook is for all the old folks. And uh, TikTok and Snapchat are for the young folks. And Twitter, Instagram, that's for in between. And so something you post on Facebook may not work on TikTok. And so you have to make sure you're diversifying that social media. So it one, it gives everyone that inside access to your program and you continue it to be your best marketing agent for your program. Man, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a, a word from a good friend, Zach Harris. I've never had a bad administrator in any of my tenure. You know why? Because <laughs> I trained them. I trained the administrators. <laughs> I had a great rapport with them. So they were able to understand exactly what I wanted and needed. And I was able to, to, to maneuver things in such a way that they were giving it to us gladly. They were able to do it and they, they found ways to make it happen for our students, for our parents and other stakeholders, because they knew if we were successful at doing it, they were going to look good. It is important to have a great rapport with your administrators. And one way to do that is to volunteer for things that you wouldn't normally volunteer for. Yes, I, I, what I mean by that is this. If there is a master scheduling committee, get on it because that's going to help you too. If there is a dance committee or something like that for, for another student activity on campus, volunteer because that's how you get with the other teachers so they don't get uh, so sidetracked when you need to take the students out of their classroom. They're going to already have a report with you and they say, oh, Mr. Irvin needs you. And they, they, go ahead, don't worry about it. You turn this in. Yes, it does work. It won't work all the time, but it works most times. Make sure you have that report. Uh, the next thing... Can I say I one, say, one, one, one yeah, other thing about, about that rapport with the administration? I think it's also important that you handle your business. So oh, yeah. do your like do your paperwork, come come to work on time, do all the stuff that you're supposed to, so the administration doesn't have to worry about you. A lot of times there's a lot of trust happening in the music land. And so the only time they think about us is when we aren't doing what we're supposed to do. So I want you to, you know, think about continue being self-sufficient, turn your paperwork in on time. On time, yeah. And and just handling your business overall. Like if there if if there's a fundraising thing that needs to happen, go for it, and make sure you get all the stuff in on time. Turn your money in how you're supposed to. Yeah. And one thing I want, I want to say another thing about the report with your administration. You know, we get swag all the time, T-shirts and all this other stuff. Get one for your administration and don't just like put it on your desk. Make a big deal about it. Oh, my God, Miss Risper, you're the best principal in the world and you've been our supporter. And we, we thought it's important that you have this T-shirt and we want you to wear it with pride because we have pride representing the school. And you make a big deal about all of that stuff. Like Will was saying earlier, when you have kids make all county. Share it with the administration. Yeah. We had we had five kids make all county because we have such a supportive administration that helps us do things like this. It's gonna go a long way. And and also the last thing with the administrators is take some things off of their plate every now and then. If they got cafeteria duty and, and you don't and you happen to come in the cafeteria and say, Hey, principal so and so, hey, I'll take I'll take your duty, you know, right now. I appreciate everything you're doing for us. I'll take care of it. Don't go to your principal only when you need something. Don't go to your AP only when you need something. Go to them to just ask about their day, ask about their life, their family, because they need to know that you have a personal relationship with them that's outside of you asking for stuff. You know, because guess what? If you if you establish that relationship, 
they'll be more apt to give you what you need even when you don't ask for it. So it's important mm. to communicate well, communicate often, and as Brett just highlighted in the chat, be as transparent as possible. Be as transparent as possible. Folks, we made it to the top. And all I just wanted to say to you is thank you. Uh, Jack wants to also you know, say thank you for having us. And if there are any questions that you have about how we did it in Title I schools or in, in underrepresented schools, feel free uh, to put that in the chat at this time. We, we, we can ask those questions. Um, Jack, you want to say anything to everybody? Yeah, I just I just want to re reiterate what the great Dr. William Irvin said. Thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you guys for for being uh, co-collaborators with us and participating in the chat. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Will for being awesome and uh, help helping this presentation go so smoothly. Any questions, folks? We are here to answer your questions. Hey, LMEA, we are, we really appreciate. It. I see we got a question here from BJ. <laughs> Growing up in North Carolina, uh, do you like cheer wine or sun drop? That's for you, Jack. Well, you in you in North Carolina now? I, I've been a North Carolina resident for uh, two two months. Uh, sorry, two weeks. So, um, <laughs> but being from South Carolina, I know both, and I would have to say cheer wine, but. Um, Dr. Pepper is my drink of choice. <laughs> Coca Cola is in your check in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you all for coming on and, and sharing with us today. Feel free to reach out to either of us if you have questions or, or need some help along the way. We are here for you. Uh, Cameron, what you got there? How did we get our parents involved? Oh, that's a pretty, pretty cool question, Cameron. Uh, for me, making them a part of the situation from the very beginning. Uh, before I even talked to the students about the vision for the program, I met with the parents. And one thing I did with the parents when I first started both the schools, the major schools I talked about earlier, is I invited them out uh, to the bedroom for a meal, took things you know, off of their plate and talked about, hey, this is what we plan on doing and this is how I see that we can do it. And the parents bought in and they became uh, very innovative in their fundraising. Uh, they even went to a parent booster uh, institute. Uh, we we followed things by uh, Band Booster to the Rescue, David Vander Walker, uh, and uh, he went to their clinics and everything. And when I tell you it worked, it worked to a T. And they were there turning the lights on the practice field for my students, just like the picture you showed earlier today. And once you get the parents involved, it makes things so much easier uh, in, in bringing the students along. Uh, it it was a little bit different for me uh, where where I was. Um, I had to beg, borrow, deal, barter, and <laughs> trick them um, in, in, into coming. We, um, in, in my situation, I had a lot of parents that worked three jobs and they, and so I had to figure out, hey, can you just do this one thing? Hey, can you just do this? And I, you know, we got them to buy in to, to, to them program and its importance and having meetings with them and phone calls and phone calls and phone calls until, you know, they got tired of me calling and they they started volunteering but it 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 it, it, it took it took it took a lot of a lot of uh, legwork trying to get them there and it started with one or two parents and that kind of expanded from there well it's different soil we had to we had to do we had to do the things that we had to do in our different gardens and That's right even my predecessor uh cameron uh Sumner smith uh what he did was totally different so you know the parents had to volunteer for at least two activities uh, for their students to be considered for the marching band award at the end of the year at the banquet. And so parents were volunteering out the woodworks because they did not want their kids not to get their trophy at the end of the year. And it worked for him for 26 years. Oh, I like that. 26 years he did that. So that's a, that is a definitely a good way. And what, what happened was those parents that were a part of that, the year I came in after him, those parents were still there and we continue to have a good nucleus of parents. And I would have bamboo meetings of 40, 50 parents or 40, 50 households. Uh, even at Baker, we had a good parent booster. And that's very huge uh, for, for that community. And they were able to do not as large in numbers, but they worked hard. And you had a good nucleus that made sure the trailer got where it's supposed to go, that the, that the, uh, the hymns were sown and that the food was prepared. All those things were very important. So it is a way for us to creatively get those parents involved. And I and I can't can't be on a conversation with Will without mentioning the billboards 
they put up for him in Baker <laughs> because of all of the great work he he uh, did in his community with the community and the parents at large. Yeah, community, parents, administration, and our, our colleagues in the fine arts department in the city of Baker have been phenomenal. And uh, I, I'm still here helping them out, even though I'm in a different capacity. So, hey, we make it happen. Well, folks, we come to an end. We appreciate everything. Uh, and we love talking with you. If you can, come on by, give us a call. Hey, we, Jack and I are all over the place, and you can feel free uh, to reach out to him and uh, Tales from the Band Room on a on, uh, podcast. And you can check me out on Fourth Wednesdays with the HBCU Collective uh, for the Con Selmer Connect. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.